to kick things off, so I know when I have a chance to talk to Kim Jones from Intuit, it's always going to be a lively conversation. So thank you so much for joining me, Kim. <laughs> Truly my pleasure, Simone. I'm looking forward to this one. Um, perfect. Well, if we could maybe, before we get into our topic, if you would mind just giving us and the audience a quick introduction and name, title, and what you do in the cybersecurity world. Okay, uh, my name is Kim Jones. I'm the Director of Performance Acceleration for Cybercraft. That's the Cybersecurity Compliance Risk and Fraud Team at Intuit. Uh, this is my 36th or 37th year in intelligence, security, and risk. I'm a former CISO. I'm an instructor at a couple of universities. I've built an academic program. I teach for SANS, and I just generally try and make the community a little better. Awesome. Well, normally we spend a lot of time on this segment talking about solutions to the cyber people problem, which you focus a lot on. But today, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about a possible hurdle. <laughs> so we're doing the anti-solution spotlight, at least for publicly traded company um, companies, and that's the SEC's heightened focus on cybersecurity. So for background for anyone listening, on October 30th of this year, the United States Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC, announced it filed charges against SolarWinds and its CISO for defrauding investors and customers through misstatements and omissions that concealed poor cybersecurity practices and failed to disclose its increasing cybersecurity risks. So pretty, pretty kind of bold and, 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 and groundbreaking stuff on the SEC's part there. Um, Not really, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, against that backdrop, you know, the disclosure rules of the SEC were, are now set to take effect in December. Um, these charges from October seem to indicate that the SEC is poised not only to enforce the new disclosure requirements, but also kind of look to other possible violations that stem from inadequate cybersecurity practices. So. There's a, a key theme um, that I think is kind of, that I would like to talk about today around the SEC, but also the theme of the complaint, which is around management's awareness of ongoing cybersecurity issues, the failures of those um, cybersecurity practices over the years, and the fact that it didn't disclose them. Um, so that's the backdrop, Kim. Let's get right to the good stuff here. As a former CISO, what's your hot take on these recent charges? <coughs> <laughs> so, first, the general disclaimer to make all the lawyers in my life happy. Uh, the opinions you're about to hear and I'm about to express are my own. They do not reflect into its opinions or in opinions of any of our customers. I am not a lawyer. I do not play one on TV. I am an old security guy, so I'm comfortable giving my opinion. Take it for what it's worth. All right. All disclaimers done. All disclaimers right. Disclaimers aside. <laughs> so, got it. Let's go. <laughs> so... My focus here, I, I, you, you talked about the complaint against the SEC, and you talked about the complaint against the CISO. Let me start with the latter and then move to the former very briefly. As a layman, the complaint against the CISO centers around the concept of fraud and centers around your, your say-do, what you said and what you did, you know, differed in terms of internal versus external, et cetera. I'm an old intelligence guy. I'm a West Point grad, as you know. I spent 10 years in Army intelligence, and I was raised with the saying that my job was to always very, very directly, very, very openly tell the truth on the ground. Now, yes, that truth on the ground is based upon my educated opinion. What the commanders who actually move the troops do with that is their call. And I took that mentality into my time as a CISO and into my time as a security professional. I have often said that I only fail in my job as a CISO, not if I get breached, but if leadership can credibly make the statement they didn't know. And note that I caveated that with credibly. Yeah. So my job is more than one occasion to be the bearer of bad news. My job is on more than one occasion to tell people stuff that they would rather not hear because it is relevant to their ability to make good risk-based decisions. More than once in my career, I have been pressured to change my opinion. I have been threatened with my job to change my opinion. 
which meant more than once in my career, I have calmly set my badge down on the desk and asked for an escort out of the building, at which case, by the way, in all cases, management backed off and we had a good conversation and we got through it. If, big if, the allegations against the CISO are proven to be valid, it would appear that that level of solid line in the sand or in the, in the, in the concrete was not maintained. And again, mm. big ifs here. I don't know the case. I am right. not a lawyer. All those pieces in there. Yeah. But if those allegations prove to be correct, this was a case of you draw the line in the sand, you communicate up, and you don't move. I think collectively, and this is the old guy in me, that as the profession has evolved, we have forgotten or may have put on the back burner the need for us and the importance for us to do that. Yeah. So that's the CISO end. Right. And and, and if I so could we'll, go ahead, but please. It, it it sounds like kind of what you're you're kind of saying here is that you can very realistically see an environment where someone in a position at a public company like SolarWinds is even if they're coming to the table saying the the bad news or kind of trying to be transparent, there's a lot of pressure, whether it's overt or maybe a little bit more sub subversive, even if non intentional, to essentially be like, you know what, I will back off. I'm not going to sort so, of like keep this hard line in the sand and, or in and the concrete. The problem that I have and the problem that I have here is that we're as a profession we act as if that's new. Yeah. We're doing this a long time. That's the gig. That has always been the gig. It will always be the gig. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to take my sledgehammer and beat the company up right. you know, in public domains. You know, I have had, I have no problem, t and I grew up in financial services, heavily regulated environment. Yeah. Regulator comes in and says, you're not doing this. My answer is, you're absolutely correct. Here's why we're not doing it. I'm aware we're not doing it, and here's what I'm doing to fix it, and here's how long it's going to take. Yeah. Okay. I've never had a problem with the regulator <laughs> externally or otherwise. Right. And, you know. But you know, where I have problems, it's like the old Watergate saying, Simone, you're, you're in the D.C. area. It wasn't the crime. It was the cover-up. Right. <laughs> where you have problems is if I'm deliberately not looking because I don't want to see what's out there or I'm hiding what's going on. Right. It's like, look, this is a case where here's what the requirement is. Or if I disagree with your interpretation of the requirement and my interpretation of the requirement, we got lawyers on both sides. Figure it out. Tell me what my opinion is, and I'll go that way. Right. I don't have a problem with that, and no CISO should. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you, a, um, we didn't discuss this off, so I realize I am throwing this at you here, but... Um, I'd feign shock, but it's okay. I know. Just bring it. <laughs> but, you know, as a, um, as a recovering lawyer, so I'll ask the question on behalf and apologize for my entire profession on the lawyer side. Do you think that some of the issue is because, you know, when I think about this from an attorney's perspective, sort of being able to say credibly yes, but like we're not aware of any issues and so there's not a duty to disclose, is that a, a convenient excuse? Because that seems oh, like... Oh, <laughs> the Ken Lay Enron defense. I love it. Right. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know. You know, you, you know, I'm not malicious. I'm a moron. Okay, so, you know, I apologize. I apologize to the relatives of Ken Lay who may watch this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all, all, all kidding aside, look, let's talk about a few things in that regard. If we were talking about financial statements and we're talking about profit and loss, you as a lawyer in your profession would have a harder time justifying that Absolutely. argument. Because technology seems to be this mysterious netherworld and there's no black and white answers because I'm literally fighting bad guys who are innovating as quickly as we are, there's some discomfort there. But let's take a holistic step back before we go make statements like that, and, and, you know, or before your profession makes – or former yeah. profession makes statements like that. Um, the really unique thing about the data-driven economy – is that you must feed the beast consistently in order for the economy to succeed. Think about what happens if people say, nope, not giving you your data anymore. 
not allowing you to collect my location data on my phone, not allowing you to collect my shopping data here. Nope, I am not giving it to you at all. The data-driven economy stops. Yeah. Think about any any prevent it stops. This is one of the unique things about a data-driven economy, and we have collectively, uh, as corporate entities, made people comfortable, big air quotes around comfortable, yeah. by either overvaluating the services that they're getting for surrendering their data or undervaluing the data that they're surrendering. The caveat is the collective aggregation of that data and the analysis you can do on that data can reveal a lot of personal things yeah. about you as a human being. There's a great campaign going on in a European country now where they age up a baby who's now projecting her um, image to her parents in the movies, talking about all the data they're putting online and all the ramifications it could have to her down the line that are huge. Yeah. So the problem that we have here is unlike if you fudge your financial statement, yes, your shareholders, your customers, your pension holders, et cetera, can go, you know, you know, if you fudge your financial statements, those things can be impacted. What happens if I don't protect all of the data I have on Simone? Yeah. You know, all of the mundane things from where she shops, you know, the stuff she buys regularly, which if you're doing some sort of Fry's or Albertsons type discount program, that data is available to, you know, the type of diapers your kid used, to the stuff that you put on face, and the list goes on. What am I capable of doing that could potentially impact you as a human being at a very visceral and intimate level if I surrender, you know, if I, you know, that data gets lost, stolen, yeah. et cetera? So I'm now in a place where the engine that is helping to drive your business is not the data that's not that's just at rest, but the data that continues to stream into your business. So it has a significant business impact for you. So why wouldn't you as the CEO and board of directors want to know that? Yeah. And worse, it has an ability to create not immeasurable harm, but harm at levels that I believe are unprecedented to your customers if that data is exposed. I think it would be an act of negligence for leadership not to want to be aware. Yeah. You know, um, just I'll share a, a personal story. So I'll keep it anonymous to protect the those that are part of this. But And I won't share who I had the conversation with, but it was probably about a year ago I was speaking with a lawyer um, who works at a, a large firm, advises some large companies on all kinds of these types of issues. And... Kim, as you know, as as we both know, we're we're we are simpatico in sharing a you know passion for understanding the industry, cybersecurity roles, the gaps, what we have in our workforces, the decisions that we can use from that data to fill those roles. And I think that this applies to kind of overall cybersecurity controls as well. This lawyer told me that she would never want a client to even know that type of information because it would open the can of worms that there would be a requirement to disclose. And the only situations would be if it were under privilege, um, because that would then at least protect some obligation to disclose. And I'm, I'm just curious, because as we get into the SEC more broadly now, like, is there a risk that there are, you know, because of these unintended, unforeseen consequences of, of cybersecurity, which are distinct from financial principles, that management's decision making is just really behind because it's not so cut and dry and where is that going to kind of move the needle on their decision making process in how to decide what to disclose um great question uh, i am of two minds here and interestingly enough i i as we're recording this a couple of days ago and i'm sure you saw this where a ransomware group reported its victim to the SEC and because it said the victim didn't disclose the fact that they, the hackers, had undergone a ransomware attack. So the law of unintended consequences regarding some of the SEC requirements are already beginning to head down the path. Um, 
it does not surprise me that any warrior would want to have more things done under privilege wherever possible to protect the interests of the employees, the company, the shareholders, the stakeholders, right. et cetera. I genuinely and sincerely believe we've got about three years before we see some regulatory backlash on that. Because now we're at a point where you're going to see people abuse the, you know, the, the issue of privilege. And to the point where it's going to neuter the regulatory framework that's out there, to the point where the regulators are going to say, excuse my language, screw it, <laughs> we're going to mandate certain things be disclosed, a la what you know HIPAA and high tech have done, you know, from a regulatory standpoint. Yeah. So I, I think that we're going to see that bar raised as rather than respond with an appropriate risk balanced framework and the ownership of the decisions by the executive team and the leaders to say, yes, we did this and here's why, that instead we're trying to hold these things in and protect ourselves versus step up with responsibility, I genuinely think we're going to see some, regula some regulatory backlash on that in three to five years. Got it. But you know, there are things that make sense, yeah. you know, and there's a balancing act but I'm of the mindset that the ability, and again, by putting things under privilege, if I want to take action against those things, and I'm not a lawyer and don't play one on TV, but as a CISO, I've dealt with lots of lawyers. If I get to the point where I'm trying to act on this finding of this assessment that I've done, my ability to expose those pieces and parts depending upon the nature of the assessment now creates an environment where I may have to expose that item that's underprivileged to an unreasonable amount of people. And if I do that, then you run the risk of the privilege being said, yeah, no, <laughs> and being thrown out anyway. Right. How's that for a non-lawyer who's had, there you <laughs> go. had these conversations you do before? No, 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 no. But seriously, so there are places where it does make sense. Yeah. It should be considered like everything else as another tool in the arsenal. Throwing everything you do under privilege is inane. But there are things that you may want to start there or may want to do through the legal arm as well. But at the end of the day, I need to go have a conversation with my CEO as the CISO that says this is a problem and I don't necessarily need nor should I want nor should my CEO want a lawyer in the room every time I open my damn mouth. Yeah. Well, and I think you put up you bring up a really good point, which is that, you know, it's always a delicate balance between regulators and businesses, and that's regarding every area, um, especially around public companies and disclosures. And obviously, there's a bigger conversation around, you know, are, are regulations like this an overextension? Are they actually a requirement? Because they, you know, otherwise we would have a repeat of things like 2008, whatever it is. But I'm, I'm going to answer that question for you later Got and it. give you an opinion because I have a very strong opinion on that. But please finish your question. Yeah, but um, but I'm actually asking you to now switch from playing a lawyer on TV to sort of now being a um, – you're going to read some tea leaves for us here. What do you think are some of the potential downstream consequences that these recent charges and kind of the SEC's actions will have on the way public companies – maintain and report on their cybersecurity practices? Like, is this going to change the game or the way that companies and their management think about this? Or is it also a longer tail and it's going to take three to five years? It's also going to be a longer tail because in my mind, Simone, these are the same conversation. I took my first CISO gig in 2003. These are the same conversation. And this is pre-PCI. That's how old this is. These are the same conversations we've been having for 20 years. The only issue is, in my mind, that the conversations are becoming real because now there are poten there's potential teeth behind it. It is business's natural reaction to say you're regulating us to the point where we can't do you know we, we, we can't do things, and I understand that and I respect that. There are times I agree with that. My problem with that is it has taken so damn long for business to understand the potential ramifications because there hasn't been a total meltdown in, in the environment when these breaches have occurred and people have not been kinetically harmed or most people haven't been kinetically harmed regarding the environment. 
that we're not necessarily taking the gravity of a risk seriously. And I'm saying this collectively across the board. Yeah. Now, here's the counterpoint. The security profession hasn't been expressing the gravity of that risk in a structured, logical framework or fashion that will allow the business to make decisions. We either say the sky is falling or eh, it's okay or somewhere in the middle. Right. It has not been until a recent decade where frameworks like FAIR have come out that have allowed us to truly quantify risk. Right. And even then, there are very few companies right now that are consistently using that to drive decision making. Yeah. And when we do, we end up having arguments that, yeah, the risk is a whole lot bigger than you thought it was. So then we start having fun with numbers to bring it down to a more palatable number. Right. Like you're so, saying, so you're you know, saying like the, the, the good old uh, stoplight chart may be insufficient because there's not enough data behind it in most cases to actually justify yeah. those colors. <laughs> Any company that is a consumer, not just keeper, you know, but a true consumer of data that is using stoplight charts is placing itself in danger. And that is a very, very strong fixed opinion of mine. Yeah. Any company that is using that, to, you know, for st stoplight charts for red, yellow, green when you're green when you're holding data at, at any sort of scale and utilizing data, you're yeah, you, know, you are truly avoiding the hard risk conversations, and you're setting yourself up to be not only a potential victim by the bad guys, but you're also setting yourself up to be a target of the regulators. You know, get into your risk, understand your risk. And I don't care what the process is. I'm a FAIR fan, yeah. but you don't have to go to FAIR, but have a process to evaluate risk and answer. And, and the biggest thing, Simone, is answer the question, what you're going to do about it, okay? And, and, I, and I go back to where I started. If you know there's a problem, decide what you wish to do about it. And that decision may be nothing, and it may be nothing right now. But if you make that decision, own it. Don't tap dance around it. Yeah. Don't try and avoid it. Don't lawyer through it. Own it. Well, you didn't do anything about this. You're exactly right. Here's why. And stand on that. You do that, I believe that 99% of the time, you won't have a problem with any regulation that comes down the pike. Yeah. We have lost collectively our stomach as a profession for doing that in my opinion yeah well i think we've thrown a gauntlet here i mean i was going to ask you next what are some of the ways that you would recommend CISOs at public companies evaluate and report on their cyber practices you know for not only the overall security of the company but their filings i think you gave us a couple starting points here right whether it's fair or some other more data driven process are there any other um, recommendations that you could discreetly say if maybe someone's not at a point where they are mature enough in an organization to use something like FAIR? Like, what are some things that they could do to evaluate and report on their cybersecurity practices and overall position, especially when it comes to public companies who have to file? I am a huge, 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 huge fan of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, for those of you watching the states, I go to NIST.gov, Google it, you'll find it. Um, if uh, outside of the states, one of the reasons I'm a huge fan of it is because they're fairly comprehensive, they're well structured, and oh, by the way, they're free. So you don't have to pay for the models. The CSF is truly the first, in my knowledge, risk focused framework out there. It lists everything you need to do by function area all of the areas that you can take a look at and allows you to first decide how strong you need to be in each of those areas and then you know, based upon your own risk acceptance model. You know, a startup is going to have a higher appetite for risk than a Fortune 500 company or should <laughs> you know, than a Fortune 500 company. Even better, if you get into the framework, it tells you, guys, if you're and if you're a small mom and pop startup or just 10 or 15 people, please, God, don't try and implement everything in the framework. You know, pick the ones that make the most sense for you, start there, and then grow. 
So the framework tells you don't try and implement 456 things simultaneously. It's insane. So you start with what are the things we need to do, what levels we need to be at, and then put yourself at that level. Those are decisions. Those are risk-based decisions, and then you report on where you are against those decisions. And where comparative data exists with like companies, you compare yourself and make decisions as to whether you're leading, lagging, or you want to catch up. Now, I love the CSF as a framework to do that, and it's simple. So I'd start there. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think, you know, Kim, first of all, thank you so much for, for joining and having this conversation. I think it's going to be really enlightening for a lot of folks that are watching and listening. One of the key takeaways I have is that, you know, regardless of where you land on the overall, you know, power of the SEC, whether like regulation should be there, generalized disclosures moving forward are going to spell trouble for any company that chooses to just kind of put like a peanut butter boilerplate language into their filings, especially if there's some sort of red flag or a breach, because that's just going to be something that is going to allow the SEC to like glom onto, right? And a lot of, I've seen a lot of these filings. Like we say, oh, like we're doing these stock boilerplate things in cybersecurity to kind of manage our risk. And I just, I, my takeaway is like, that's not gonna be sufficient anymore. Um, as a lawyer, you know language matters even more than I do. And my wife is a, was a comparative lit major and is a published author. So she corrects my grammar and my language usage regularly. Otherwise, I would continue to speak mindless babble. Um, you used the language that this is going to be a problem or this is going to be trouble from the regulatory framework. I do want to reframe that a bit. Um, 17 years ago, I wrote a, and gave a presentation called the 21st Century CISO. And I made some predictions as to where the profession, et cetera, was going. And I went back and someone, one of my former students in one of my classes dug it up and found it online and said that, you know, you realize most of your predictions had come true. So I actually dug it up and took a look at it. One of the things that I made the statement there was as the data-driven economy grows, if we don't, as a profession, take the bull by the horns and decide what those standards are going to be, it is going to be taken out of our hands. And it is going to be given to the attorneys in the form of the regulations. And we chose not to do that. There are a lot of reasons, and I talk with my fellow professionals as to why we should or should not have done that, but we set this landscape. Business is taking advantage of the data pipelines that are coming in. In the same way that banks and credit card firms write into their budgets that there is going to be some loss for fraud. We will minimize it as much as we can, but fraud loss to zero is not a realistic expectation for any of the major credit card processors, period, yeah. full stop. When you're playing with data, you're playing with people's lives. And those of us who are first world and or are privileged enough to be doing relatively well in first world do not necessarily see the impact of that data loss, see the impact of a single mom shopping at Walmart with a cart full of groceries whose credit card has declined because her bank account has been hijacked because someone just stole all of her money. Those impacts are real. And if we don't get in front of them as a profession, it is reasonable to expect that the regulators are going to do what they can to protect not just their constituents, but people in general. So I'm waiting for the person or the technology company or the Silicon Valley company or the business company to come out and give me ironclad security that still allows people to move and do what they need to do and allows them to make money. We've gotten closer. We're not there yet. And the security profession, while we're doing some things to get closer to there, there are cases where we're not forcing the hard risk-based conversations. 
And in those type of environments, Simone, for us to look at the regulations and the regulators as a problem versus a natural outcome of our inaction within this economy, I don't think is fair or accurate. So this is now the cost of doing business. Can we potentially turn that clock back? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But this is the cost of doing business, and we laid the groundwork through collective corporate and profession in action. And we need to own that just in the same way that we own the risk and need to own the risks that are out there. So I think that needs to be remembered as we rail at the regulators, yeah. who are also, by the way, trying to figure out what the good middle ground is between protecting constituents and giving you room to grow and do what you need to do as a business. And for a long time, it may be argued, the pendulum was on the side of growth and innovation and productivity. The pendulum is swinging. That doesn't mean it's necessarily an overstep. Not that I'm saying there are cases where it's not, where, where, where it is, rather. I'm not saying that there are cases where it's not an overstep, where it might be an overstep, but the pendulum is swinging. I think the swing is probably a little bit overdue because the regulators waited on us from an enterprise standpoint and a profession standpoint, and we didn't step up. Well said. I don't think I could do any better to that. I think it's actually a great place to stop and let people really think on that from a conversation. Um, so, Kim, thank you again for joining us um, this, this morning and appreciate all of your opinions and thoughts. Um, even if they are your own and not to represent a company or an organization, um, really enjoyed the conversation. I really did as well. Always great to talk with you, Simone. Yeah, you thank too. you for having me. No, thank you.